This is Religion and Theology, a podcast from the Center for Theology and Religious Studies. This episode of Religion and Theology is a recording of a public lecture held at CTR on the 10th of February by Professor Elaine Graham of the University of Chester, who lectured on the topic Jews, Pagans, Skeptics and Emperors, Christian Apologetics in a Post-Secular Age. This is the second lecture in the series, Beyond Secular Religious Division, The Role of Religion in the Public Sphere in Polarized Europe, which is presented by the Center for Theology and Religious Studies, as well as the Center for European Studies at Lund University. Thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation. It's very good to be with you. My title this evening, Jews, Pagans, Skeptics and Emperors, Christian Apologetics in a Post-Secular Age. In this lecture, I want to consider what it means for public theology to demonstrate an apologetic function or quality. This notion of public theology as having an apologetic dimension has been attributed to, among others, the reformed scholar Max Stackhouse, uh, who died in 2016. Apologetic public theology upholds the correlational and dialogical basis of theological understanding in relation to wider cultural discourse by seeking to communicate itself in ways that are comprehensible to a non-religious audience while remaining faithful to its Christian heritage. We may ask, however, why Max Stackhouse intentionally adopts the notion of apologetics within his definition of public theology when there are other terms available, such as correlation, mediation, or bilingualism. What is it about the notion of apologetics that might be significant for the identity of public theology? For Max Stackhouse and others, and I guess I include myself in that, it certainly embraces understandings of theology as having a public impact rather than being simply a matter of personal or privatised belief. It also rejects assumptions that theology is simply talking to the church, simply an ecclesial discourse, stressing its accessibility and accountability to non-theological insights instead. Yet beyond those two, this emphasis on apologetic discourse implies further that public theological discourse should embrace a degree of self-justification on the part of Christian theology as a credible form of public reasoning. All the more so in the contemporary West, where, due to forces such as globalisation and cultural pluralism, religion is newly prominent in public affairs, but where large parts of civil society, academic discourse and policy making remain reluctant to grant it legitimacy. This necessarily entails renewed attention and circumspection to the ways in which religious values and practices are mediated into the public domain. In seeking to communicate with a secular, pluralist audience unfamiliar with its basic premises, I'll be suggesting that contemporary public theology bears some similarity to the experiences of early Christianity. The emergence of Christian apologetics from the second century of the Common Era onwards may well prove instructive for the present day, insofar as its proponents were also called upon to defend and commend the gospel to a wide range of civic and political interlocutors. Since the earliest years of Christianity, apologetics has been both intellectual discourse and appeal to the prevailing civil and political powers. Prior to Christianity becoming the state religion of Rome, Christians were required to justify their existence within a climate of plurality and conflict, in which their faith held no automatic privilege or credence. In the face of accusations that Christians were disloyal to the empire, apologists followed the injunction of the first letter of Peter to give an account of the hope that is within you. So Christian apologetics, I'll argue, has always been a form of public rhetoric, 
charged with the task of defending and commending its existence against a variety of non-believers, detractors and persecutors, hence my title, Jews, Pagans, Skeptics and Emperors. And engaging with the various powers of their day, Christian apologists were essentially doing their theology in public, justifying their faith not only on philosophical grounds, but in order to prove the political and civil probity of the church and its members. And while that provides historical precedence for public theology to reaffirm that task of translating or mediating religious beliefs into terms that are comprehensible to others and compatible perhaps with the precepts of uh, liberal pluralism, there are nevertheless further challenges that we must face for the conduct of apologetic public theology today. We need to ask exactly how religious voices might be mediated into the public square in the context of post-secular civil society in which people are both fascinated and troubled by religion. So the questions are how apologetics might work in practice and whether such dialogue requires a level of compromise with the worldviews of secular discourse that proves problematic, even impossible. Are secular institutions capable of summoning up sufficient levels of religious literacy to engage and understand their religious neighbours? Or in short, will such communicative and apologetic public theology simply get lost in translation? So, some words by way of introduction to the discipline of public theology. While we might say that theology has always had a public character and public implications, the academic discipline of public theology has emerged more formally over the past 50 years in order to address questions of the relevance that theology might have to issues of public policy and practice and to global civil society. Increasingly, too, it is examining the terms and conditions on which that contribution in word and deed might take place. In commenting on contemporary issues, public theology regards itself as a synthesis of theological sources and tradition and contextual and contemporary analysis. As Max Stackhouse says, public theology must both be rooted in a valid theological stance and able to engage the empirical conditions it purports to address. That task of reading the signs of the times in terms of understanding the contemporary context requires a range of tools of interpretation, deploying multidisciplinary inquiry. Then the sources and norms of Christian tradition can be brought to bear in an act of what Scott Peth calls active discernment of God's action in the world, which in turn leads to forms of praxis and social action. So this is, again, about the nature of theological understanding as necessarily a dialogue between the imperatives of the situation and the wisdom of received tradition. Public theology then has adopted the correlational method popularised by Paul Tillich and David Tracy in the last half of the 20th century. The theologian is alert to multiple voices or sources of understanding, including cultural information, scripture, traditions of teaching and practice. Such a process is consistent with high theologies of creation and incarnation, in which God's self-revelation is evident within the unfolding events and insights of human history and intellectual achievement, albeit subject to the critical insights of scripture and theological tradition. For Tracy and others, cultural and intellectual movements have the potential to correct and augment the received tradition of faith. Like other practical and contextual theologies then, public theology rests on a body of normative teaching, but one that is mindful of the pluralism of its own tradition, as well as the need to incorporate and listen to non-theological voices. This is theology then about public issues, but also a theology that must do its work in public, not least, as I shall indicate, in a time when the relevance of religion to wider society has come under unprecedented scrutiny. Public theology also involves a range of actors and protagonists and may take a number of forms. It's traditionally articulated through the official reports and statements of church leaders and organisations. These are often intended as contributions to the shaping of a particular debate, 
seeking to address the implicit theologies at work in public discourse, as well as drawing out the implications of Christian teaching for a particular issue. It's not a matter of making converts, but of seeking, as Ted Peters says, to demonstrate to the widest possible public that Christian symbols and doctrines shed light on our common human self-understanding. Public theologians have also recently interested themselves in how the statement of world politicians might mediate questions of religious faith, and in particular how a leader's own personal convictions might be mediated into the public square. And I commend to you Nick Spencer's book, The Mighty and the Almighty, How Political Leaders Do God. Given that liberal democratic conventions in many countries require a degree of neutrality towards religious belief in public, the statements of politicians about faith or from their own stance of faith may well prove controversial. But it serves to demonstrate how difficult it might be for personal religious commitment to be mediated into a pluralist public square. But it still considers the extent to which mainstream political leaders despite uh, our secular society in Europe and North America, how those leaders might still make use of implicit religious or theological ideas and may provide some measure of how far such values still resonate with the wider public and how far a seemingly secular electorate might still retain residual religious sympathies. And then public theology, thirdly, also has a performative or grassroots dimension insofar as the actions and practices of local faith communities might be said to constitute an enactment of core religious values. We might think here of campaigns to alert public opinion to the realities of climate emergency, which may use elements of ritual or symbolism in public demonstrations. Similarly, many local churches have a thoroughly incarnational presence in their local neighbourhoods, expressed tangibly in forms of human capital, such as the ability to summon up volunteer labour, or the ways in which physical capital, such as historic church buildings, can still be put at the disposal of communities in need. Or it may simply be that actions speak louder than words. Many ordinary people of faith may not be able to articulate theologically the source of their concerns in formal doctrinal terms, but nevertheless they will still regard their commitment to social action and to public service as a natural outworking of their faith, something to which I will hope to return later. So three key manifestations of public theology as it may be expressed. To return then to Max Stackhouse's characterization of public theology as a form of apologetics. For him, public theology certainly draws on dogmatic and doctrinal theology insofar as, as I mentioned before, it mediates the core convictions of the Christian tradition into contemporary contexts. And clearly it's also a form of contextual theology, since it's always rooted in and addressed to specific economic, political, geographical and cultural circumstances. So it's practical also in that it seeks to seek up uh, to build up theologically based practices of faith of believers both in the church and the world. But Stackhouse insists that the primary focus in his terms, the primary focus of public theology must be on apologetics. It is difficult, he argues, to understand how an intense conviction could form or guide a society or civilization without having an argument as to why it should be believed. So this is not simply about demonstrating the internal logic of Christian language to those who are already familiar with theological tradition. Rather, it aims to persuade Christians to move beyond the confines of internal debate and a preoccupation with the ordering of the church towards working with their non-religious neighbours around the legitimacy of religious insights in the first place. In other words, its justification rests in its ability to transcend its own circumstances in order to contribute constructively to a wider common good. Apologetic public theology defends the terms on which religion might contribute to the public square in the first place. But it also regards such justification as going beyond mere persuasion into the promotion of a constructive civil conversation that seeks the enrichment of the raised publica for the sake of the common good.
as Max Stackhouse argues then, every theology, every theology has to meet the test of public reception. Not least precisely because it tries to reflect more than the sectional opinions of marginal communities or people who like that sort of thing, and instead attempts to convey practical and normative proposals for policy and action on the widest possible political stage. So why might apologetics and apologetic public theology have a particular currency for us at this time? It's notable that religion and belief are once again prominent throughout the world. Despite those predictions that the processes of secularization, at least in Western societies, would lead to its virtual disappearance from public life. But this phenomenon is not, I think, simply a question of what Peter Berger has famously called de-secularization. It's not a reversal of secularization. It's certainly possible to see the global influence of religiously motivated political movements, such as the rise of radical Islamic movements, the political heft of the Christian evangelical right continuing in US politics, and the rise of Hindu identity politics in India as signs of religious resurgence. Another determining factor has been that of globalization. Global migration has fostered religious diversity and heightened awareness of the links between religious profession and cultural or ethnic identity. So those are signs of the resurgence of religion, and religion continues to be a potent force in many aspects of global civil society, increasingly identified by governments as a significant source of social capital and political mobilization. But while patterns of religious observance and affiliation may declining, be declining rapidly, other indicators suggest a greater complexity. So we have both decline and resurgence. We see a personal interest, uh, an interest in personal spirituality beyond creedal, formal, institutional expressions of religion, especially in the way concepts of mindfulness, spiritual well-being and spiritual care have come to suffuse professional practice and institutional cultures. So we have declined, certainly. Um, we have a continuing trajectory of secularization. But we have either other signs of resurgence and, if you like, mutation, which mean this is more than simply a reversal of secularization. And this is what many of us are calling the post-secular, and it signifies a number of features, I think. It is, in part, an acknowledgement of the persistence of conventional religious beliefs and practices, alongside the emergence of novel forms of religious engagement within the public square. But it also represents a collapse of the binaries of religion and secularity that have characterized so much of Western modernity. As the sociologist Charles Taylor has argued, the interesting story is not simply one of decline, but also of a new placement, a new placement of the sacred or spiritual in relation to individual and social life. This new placement is now the occasion for recompositions of spiritual life in new forms and for new ways of existing both in and out of relation to God. One way I have of putting this is that many Western democracies continue at the level of government and policy making to be shaped by the paradigm of secularism, even if the predictions of secularization, of religious decline, have had to be revised. And if religion is a resurgent political force, this is occurring against a backdrop of religious scepticism and reluctance to accommodate those newly resurgent religious actors and practices into what is still regarded as an operationally secular body politic. So while scholars such as Jürgen Habermas have called for the reintroduction of religious actors and associations into a formerly secular liberal public square, the debate continues as to how and on what terms such faith-based reasoning and faith-based action might be communicated, and in particular whether religious communities should be expected to accommodate themselves to the dominant secularist view. And we're coming back to familiar territory, really, for public theologians, who insist that Christians must articulate their core principles in terms that are accessible to pluralist secular society.
perhaps this might call for a renewal of the practice of Christian apologetics. Essentially a question of how to engage with a non-Christian interlocutor in order to persuade that person of the validity of Christian faith and practice. The early Christian epistle, the first letter of Peter, summarises this imperative as follows. This is 1 Peter 3.15. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. So I wonder, is there sufficient historical precedent to imagine that this early Christian history has something to say to the challenges of contemporary post-secularity? Avery Dulles's History of Apologetics, first published in 1971, provides a useful entry point into considering the nature and scope of early Christian apologetics. From a focus on forming the beliefs and practices of the Christian community during the first two centuries of its existence, concerning questions of Christian induction and the nurture and life of the church, writers then began to turn outwards to debates within, with the world beyond the church until by the middle of the second century, as Dulles says, apologetics became the most characteristic form of Christian writing. Such literature, Dulles argues, addressed a range of interlocutors, from educated converts and philosophical teachers to Jews and the imperial powers. While some apologies were directed towards conversion and intellectual defences, there were also political apologies, as he says, Dulles says, designed to win civil tolerance. This alerts us then to the fact that once the first Christian communities had become established, an important aspect of early Christian apologetics was to gain recognition from the civil authorities and win protection against persecution and slander. The New Testament provides some early indications of what we might term an apologetic approach conducted in the pluralist public square. On the day of Pentecost, the disciples address a multicultural assembly in a diversity of languages, a sign of the power of the Holy Spirit to unite human divisions and of the universal nature of salvation in Christ. This power to transcend cultural difference, however, extends also to Peter's use of his audience's pre-existing religious worldviews, as he cites the Hebrew prophets to proclaim Jesus as the promised Messiah, and the fulfilment of the scriptures. Similarly, when preaching in Athens, the Apostle Paul speaks first at the synagogue, presenting the gospel as the fulfilment of the Hebrew scriptures. But in his speech to the pagan pluralist crowd at the Areopagus, or marketplace, he emphasises how their monument to an unknown god is uh, ancient uh, uh, from ancient philosophy, essentially prefigures the revelation of Jesus Christ. The good news, he argues, is not an esoteric secret, but intelligible to all reasonable people. What Justin Martyr later termed the seeds of the word, seminar verbi, which are present in other sacred traditions. And another clue to the significance of apologetics comes from that first letter of Peter, thought to date from the first century in the common era. Probably addressed to a group of churches in Asia Minor, perhaps undergoing a period of hostility due to their refusal to participate in certain civic rights honouring the emperor. So highly political in terms of their behaviour and their political loyalties. The writer of this letter attempts to offer advice and encouragement to communities facing such treatment. And against accusations that the early Christians engaged in scandalous cultic practices, the letter argues that it was expedient to be answerable to public scrutiny. The letter says, for it is by God's will that by doing right, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Live as free men, yet without using your freedom as a pretext for evil, but live as servants of God. Christians are exhorted to think through the meaning of their faith and its relation to public life and be prepared to respond intelligently and openly when asked. And yet the warrant or exoneration for Christ crucified, the way that Christ is preached, rests in the exemplary behaviour of the church. 
as one commentator puts it, by living distinctive and exemplary lives, refusing either to submit to persecution or assimilate to ungodly values, these Christian communities are urged to identify with Christ's redemptive suffering, thereby pledging their hope in the ultimate victory of the cross. In the face of persecution, however hard their privations, Christians can be assured that they share in the sufferings of Christ crucified and that they too participate in the hope of the resurrection, which forms the basis, the warrant of their apologetic. As that passage says in more detail, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behaviour in Christ may be, may be ashamed of their slander. This echoes a rabbinic saying of the time. Be alert to study the law and know how to make an answer for the believer. And history suggests that such a defence of Christian faith could either be formal and legal in a court of law or personal in conversation. And in fact, the origins of the term apologetics, apologia, has associations with the kind of defence mounted in a secular court of law. And in the writings of Eusebius of Caesarea in the early 4th century, um, we see the argument that the apologia, by definition, implies some kind of public petition, some kind of discourse with the powers that be and maybe the emperor or his representatives. The conjunction of public theology and apologetics in these writings, therefore, can be seen in the apologist's defence of Christians' moral and civic integrity to both imperial and intellectual publics alike. While early Christian apologetics defended the intellectual coherence and scriptural provenance of their faith, their arguments were also directed towards offering a theologically reasoned rationale for the right to identify both as persons of faith and practice as legitimate citizens. And it's this conjunction, I think, of discipleship and citizenship that is another characteristic of this emergent public theology. Such apologies appeal to ideals of natural justice in their petitions regarding the way in which all reasonable citizens might expect imperial power to exercise. Christians are expecting no special favours, but they are expecting equal treatment alongside other citizens as well. But again, I think we can see that these early Christian apologies prefigure the dialogical and bilingual qualities of modern public theology in that they affirmed the need to adopt the worldviews and presuppositions of their interlocutors in order to make a full appeal. Some contemporary theologians have been sceptical of the possibility of apologetics since it presupposes a shared territory of common reason between church and world that they, found, that they find unacceptable. Equally, public theology's bilingual and dialogical stance has been accused of an unacceptable deference towards secular reason. But I would argue that the very essence of the apologetic approach to public theology guarantees the integrity of both sides of that conversation, both tradition and contemporary experience. So, to those within the churches who assume that even in a post-secular society, their truth claims will be self-evident, public theologians argue that they have to make them accessible and credible to non-theological audiences in order to speak across the post-secular divide. And to those who suspect that it is enough for Christians to demonstrate their sincerity through the integrity of their actions without having to express more substantively in words, public theologians again insist on showing how procedural questions of social justice and the common good rest on matters of ultimate value rooted in Christian teaching that need to be clearly articulated. <laughs> 
But it's fair to say that Christian apologetics in the modern era, certainly the end of the 20th century, has largely been dominated by forms of propositional deductive argument, often based on understandings of the inerrancy of scripture designed to win converts. But many critics regard this particular kind of apologetic reasoning based on logic and positivist evidence as representing something of a narrowing of the apologetic tradition. They argue that this strand of apologetics has allowed itself to be captured by the logic of modern secular reason that represents, as Myron Penner, a critic, says, a kind of apologetic positivism, a kind of apologetic positivism, according to which Christian beliefs must be demonstrably rational to be accepted. Penner calls for a departure from this kind of adversarial tradition of apologetics in which being a Christian amounts to giving intellectual assent to specific propositions. And Avery Dulles, perhaps rather unkindly and uncharitably, again uh, identifies this adversarial notion of much contemporary apologetics by arguing that it's become associated with the stereotype of someone who tries by fair means or foul to argue people into joining the church. But alongside these adversarial, rationalist and propositional methods, a new generation of Christian apologists is emerging. Those who engage with non-religious publics in ways that continue that task of defending and commending Christianity, but also honouring that more conversational and dialogical fashion. And I want to give you some examples. For example, Krista Tippett a broadcaster with US Public Radio, calls upon her listeners to occupy what she calls the vast middle, the vast middle of religious commitment, which avoids the extremes of proofs and certainties in favour of a model of faith that privileges religion as a form of practical wisdom rather than a form of cognitive knowing or of fact. Tippett's radio programme, On Being, and the associated website... Uh, www.onbeing.org um, uses the media to construct a quintessential form of public theology that is both conducted in public over the airwaves and which frequently invites public figures including politicians and public intellectuals to give an account of their convictions but it's always carried out in that dialogical and non-dogmatic fashion so I think her approach affirms what she calls the conversational nature of reality, located deliberately at the intersection of religion, literature, science and politics, which for many people is, a, is quintessentially the apologetic public space, dialoguing between and across faith traditions and across the sacred secular divide. For Krista Tippett, dialogue is the way we construct meaning for ourselves, how we explore what it means to be human, and Tippett would attest where people encounter the divine. She commends this as a more conversational and civil way of learning, which seeks to meet its interlocutors halfway. She says this, In the vast middle, faith is as much about questions as it is about answers. It's possible to be a believer and a listener at the same time, to be both fervent and searching, to honour the truth of one's own convictions and the mystery of the convictions of others. The context of most religious virtue is relationship, practical love in families and communities, and care for the suffering and the stranger beyond the bounds of one's own identity. These qualities of religion should enlarge, not narrow, our public conversation about all of the important issues before us. Another contemporary writer, Francis Spofford, uh, whose, uh, the title of whose book, Unapologetic, might be seen as an ironic rejection of forms of apologetics that proceed on propositional and rationalist grounds. That kind of apologetics based on evidentialist and rationalist proofs is for him futile, because for him what matters is what Christianity feels like from the inside. What Christianity feels like from the inside. He says this, the point is that from outside, belief looks like a set of ideas about the nature of the universe, 
for which a truth claim is being made, a set of propositions that you sign up to. But it is still a mistake to suppose that it is a sense to the propositions that makes you a believer. It is the feelings that are primary. I assent to the ideas because I have the feelings. I don't have the feelings because I've assented to the ideas. And Rupert Short, in his new book, Outgrowing Dawkins, God for Grown-Ups, which is a, in part a response to new atheism, says something very similar. Another contemporary apologist, David Bentley Hart, whose refutation of new atheism focuses on religion as a public good. So again, note that marrying of civil probity, uh, political trust and religious faith. He says, as a historical force, religion has been neither simply good nor simply evil, but has merely reflected human nature in all its dimensions. But without some kind of transcendent reference, he argues, humanity's most profound moral convictions lack anchorage and descend into relativism or personal preference. The social goods of virtue, compassion and charity are, he says, not objects found in nature, but are historically contingent conventions of belief and practice, formed by cultural conventions that need never have arisen at all. Left to its own devices, there is no guarantee that humanity is capable of selfless, disinterested or charitable behaviour. The power of faith traditions to cultivate civic virtue is tribute to religion's capacity to broaden and deepen and anchor the moral imagination. And in an echo of those early Christian apologists, Hart argues that the public probity of the church will be judged not according to the logic of its propositional truth claims, but by the quality of its civic engagement. And so here again we have that sense of a more performative emphasis within postmodern and post-secular apologetics, operating as a kind of practical wisdom, orientated as much to mobilising the performative values of compassion, justice, solidarity and altruism as it is to debate scientific evidence. Apologetics, I say in my book, is a matter of being able to demonstrate how faith might make a difference to individuals and communities. Just as God encounters human beings in personal, concrete and specific ways through the incarnation, so any really effective apology will exhibit a similarly embedded, contextual and even sacramental quality. I can give lots of other examples of this kind of apologetic public theology, for example at work in the collaborations between diverse stakeholders in local civil society and local neighbourhoods, spanning what Justin Beaumont and Paul Cloak, two urban geographers, call the interconnections between religious, humanist and secularist positionalities in the dynamic geographies of the city. What they're talking about really is the kind of practical collaboration uh, within projects such as food banks, youth training, mental health projects, climate emergency demonstrations and work with migrants, where the outworking is the practical civil engagement, the outworking is collaboration, but out of those practices emerge the deeper conversations. So practice and dialogue, if you like, go together. And alongside the practical engagement goes an ongoing commitment to deep conversation about the very underlying values, religious and non-religious, non that motivate those actions. I think all of these affirm in their different ways that truth is achieved through dialogue and mutual comprehension. But it also affirms that sense by public theologians that Christian witness must always pass the test of public accountability. And for all these writers that I've quoted, this kind of apologetic dialogue emerges from the lived experience of communities either of dialogue or of shared practice, whose faith is attested to, the quality of the faith is judged by the quality of its life together. Its witness to that faith, nurtured by that common life, will rest in the social goods it promotes. But there's a danger, I guess, that a personal motivation for engaging in social action remains or can remain unspoken or implicit 
how far does such a performative form of apologetics still have to be couched in words and put to the test in a public arena? In my own work on apologetics and public theology, I've resolved this by arguing that public theology needs to be rooted in the theological concept of the missio dei, which engages in a threefold activity of discernment, participation and witness, which is both a way of engaging with the context and in conducting some sort of apologetic dialogue. Discern the signs of the times, engage in your contextual analysis, find out what God is doing, find out where God is at work and join in, participate in the mission of God in the world and then bear witness to the hope that is within you. And this is my attempt to um, ensure that apologetics is communicated in both deed and word. But clearly it requires a degree of theological literacy and confidence on the part of ordinary lay Christians if the message is not simply to be lost in translation. So to conclude, as well as framing public theology as ecclesial commentary on public affairs, speaking from a religious standpoint, I've been arguing for a further task of public theology as one of apologetic dialogue. In a religiously pluralist global context, it is expedient to articulate and defend the values that inform Christian statements about and interventions in the public realm. This apologetic function reflects a commitment on the part of many public theologians to conduct debates about the public trajectories of faith and practice in ways that are transparent and publicly accessible and defensible. It follows then that public theology is less concerned with defending the interests of specific faith communities than generating informed analyses of the moral and religious dimensions of public issues and communicating these in language that is accessible to different intellectual disciplines and faith traditions. It's about building up the quality of that common ground of discourse about democracy, human rights and the future of our planet. Apologetic public theology may not completely resolve some of the impediments to real dialogue caused by mutual incomprehension or sheer intransigence on the part of religious and secular bodies alike. That, I think, is one of the kind of agonistic and complicated issues of the post-secular, the rock and the hard place. Can we really get secularism and religion to talk to one another? But I hope that in pragmatic and performative terms, this overriding commitment to the creation of shared public space, civil public space, both physical and discursive, in which the practices and principles of citizenship can be exercised, represents a serious attempt to give substance to a theological praxis that is dialogical, interdisciplinary, pluralistic, and directed ultimately towards the achievement of the common good. Thank you for listening.